but hopefully this is working. Um, yeah, we'll just get started in like a minute. Okay. Angelina, let me know if it's working. Like, it just started. Do what? Okay. Awesome. Okay, it's 7 10. We're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to week 11. Today is special topics and accessibility. It's a little bit more chill of a lecture. You've learned all of the mechanical content that we're going to be teaching this semester. Um, so today we're going to talk about things like what you can do with Figma beyond this class is a career or for your own personal enjoyment. Um, and then we're going to revisit accessibility and talk spe specifically about universal design as well as discuss um, some things for the final and what you can expect for our last day of class. And also, thank you again for bearing with us. We know like the cancellation last week was very abrupt. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of the things that we meant to talk about last week as well. Um, yeah, so I was recovering from probably the flu um, and I should be good today, but I might still have like a lingering cough. So if I duck off screen and cough and drink some water, that's why. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So um, the attendance form for today is at yelki.com slash space. Um, this should work. I know that Yelki has been having some issues lately and hopefully next semester we'll have a better solution. Um, but yeah, yelki.com slash space, S-P-A-C-E, uh, if you wanna navigate to that now. And this is live for the next six hours or so, five or six hours, so just up until around midnight of tonight. So if you're watching this lecture later on, make sure you're using the attendance form that is sent into Slack, um, not this one. This is not going to work for you. That's yelki.com slash space. Cool. Um, so the first thing, um, just to get out of the way, is a final reminder. So talking about what the next couple of weeks are gonna be looking like um, for yourselves um, and also just generally um, when to submit the midpoint check-in. So your only homework for this week as well, for the next two weeks, um, minus break, is just to work on your final projects. Whatever state you're in right now, that is totally okay. Everyone submitted um, their proposals and I read through all of them. I'm very excited to see these. I read every single one and left feedback on every single one, so I'm very looking forward to seeing what you make. Um, and as you kind of work on these, don't worry if you feel like you need to pull back on um, the scope of your project a little bit, like if you feel like you've bitten off more than you can chew, or if you feel like um, you can take on a little bit more, that is totally okay. We understand that things happen during the semester, um, and just what is most important is that we get you to work on a project that you feel like you're excited to work on. Um, obviously, it's still just a final project for like a class, so we get it, um, but we do hope that it's something that you find interesting and engaging. Um, and you're welcome to change your proposals in any way to make it something that's fulfilling for you personally. Um, this week, you're going to have an opportunity to get feedback. Um, as a heads up, um, this week's lab is a critique session, so we're going to be doing critique within all of your lab groups. Um, it'll be pretty informal. We'll take a look at the file in a little bit um, when we do a certain demo. And then this week's also the midpoint check-in. We know that it feels maybe a little bit early, um, which is just because there's technically two weeks until this final is due because of break. We don't expect you to actually work on it the days of Thanksgiving break. Like We don't want you to have to work on this on your days off, um, which is why the midpoint check-in is prior to break. Um, but it is due this Thursday, end of day. Please just submit whatever you have. It's okay if you're not quite where you were for the midpoint check-in. We want you to have something started, to see the wheels turning at least before we go on this break. Um, whether that's just your brainstorm, whether it's paper sketches you just take a photo of and upload onto the file, whether you're figuring out colors and typography, whatever works for you. Um, we just wanna make sure that you've made some progress by this week's lab. Um, we do have the submission open until the end of the day Thursday, but we strongly recommend you get there by um, your lab session on Thursday so that you have something to share um, during the critique session. This is gonna be a good valuable time that you're gonna have everyone in your team um, have an opportunity to take a look at your work. Um, when you submit this midpoint check-in, your TA will give you feedback um, based on what you've written up in your proposal um, and also anything that you might ask for within the file itself. Um, but if you don't receive any feedback, let us know. You can ping me personally, um, and I can take another look. And also, if you just want more eyes on your work ever, you can always ping me. Um, I will look at it, I promise. We can also send it into Slack. There are other students who are auditing the course um, who obviously don't have their lab groups to have critique from. So sending things in Slack is a totally great option. 
But yeah, any questions about the midpoint submission um, or anything about this week? Cool, excited. Um, final submission, um, just since this is the last time we're gonna see you before it's due, it's gonna be a PDF with a link to the file the same way that we did the midterm. There's also gonna be a short form um, indicating if you'd like to do an, a pretty informal presentation on the final week. All you have to do is kind of do a demo of your project. We want like everyone to demo if possible, like we'd love to see everyone present. Um, it's super informal, just like taking a look at your work. Um, we're also gonna be doing that last lecture on Zoom. Um, I haven't fully decided if we're gonna be able to also do it in person. If we do it in person, I'll just ask you to like physically come up here or do it from the Zoom. Um, but yeah, we'd love to see everyone present. Um, we, we also will ask if we can maybe publish it in a file for the course so that students next semester uh, will get to see people's finals, not late how we did it this semester, so just setting us up for success for the following year. Um, the write-up, again, is the same basic process, talking through um, what you did, um, and these are also going to be graded by your TAs. Um, and it is due end of day Monday, the night before lecture 12, so 11.59 p.m. on Monday. You are welcome to use your slip day. Um, if you choose to use the slip day, but you'd still like to present what you have, please just submit the form ahead of time before you submit it. Um, and then again, these are gonna be open for late submissions as well if you need to take extra time. And if you need an extension, also just let us know as soon as possible. Um, ideally, before we head out for um, Thanksgiving break, just ping staff, let me know, let your TA know, um, and we'll be lenient with that. We don't wanna like cause any stress while you're on break. Cool. And again, final presentations. Um, we're gonna be providing a Zoom link. You don't have to have a deck or prepare anything. You can have notes if you want them personally, but it's not something that we're expecting you to put together. We're not grading you on the presentation itself. We're just grading you on the file. Um, so don't worry about like public speaking skills or anything like that. We just want everyone to have a chance to see your work. Cool. Any questions there? Any questions? Sorry, I shouldn't have moved the slide ahead. That was a surprise. Okay, well the surprise is that um, on the last week as well, we're actually inviting Noah Levin from Figma. He's the current design director at Figma, and he's gonna be joining us for a Q&A um, for part of class. So please come to class. Um, all of you, please come to class. Um, he's been very gracious in um, taking some time to come talk with us um, and answer any questions that y'all have. I know that for a lot of you, this might be your first time dipping your toes into design or just kind of learning design in a more formal environment. So please come with questions. He is an awesome guy. Uh, I'm super excited to have him in the class. Um, he'll be joining on Zoom, um, not physically. Um, but yeah, be on time, be present, um, and come prepared with any questions you have. Um, awesome. Okay, now any other questions before we get into the, the content of lecture? Awesome. Cool, so, oh, yeah. I got a question. Mm -hmm. Will the final presentation also be on Twitch? Will the final presentation also be on Twitch? Yes, because we'll be streaming it through Zoom. Um, so anyone who was enrolled in the class, basically what we did last semester was we streamed a Zoom call to Twitch, which is what we'll be doing next time as well. Um, so yes, it will be publicly on Twitch, if that answers the question. But yeah, anybody who currently attends lecture on Twitch will be attending on Zoom if they're enrolled. We'll figure out the logistics next week. Cool, any other questions? Awesome, cool. So a couple of weeks ago, you might have seen um, that there was a huge set of updates that we couldn't make curriculum for because they came out on a Tuesday and that's the day that we have class. Well, it's been several weeks now and we've made a little bit of curriculum for it. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit today about community publishing. We've mentioned this several times. Um, the flow of it changed a little bit, so we wanted to just give you another refresher on it. And also just as a final push as you're working on these final projects to publish your work to community because we would love to see it. Um, it's a really great opportunity to share your work out there and have just like a quick easy link um, to um, share it in the future. So community, as we talked about, is a space for users to discover resources, find inspiration, support creators. Um, you can contribute by publishing files, plugins, widgets, and more, and you can find tons of different things on community. Um, creator profiles are basically a way for you to get a custom profile and handle um, to share your own work. Think of it just as any kind of profile on any kind of social media site. Um, again, it's early enough in Figma's existence that you can still snag some pretty cool handles. Um, so if you're interested in that, you want to solidify your brand as a designer, you can go ahead and grab a public handle. I think a lot of us have like 
nice flex handles. I have Ace. You know, that's pretty cool. Anyways, um, you have to have a profile in order to interact with other resources besides duplicating. Um, so if once you make a handle, you can do things like liking, following, commenting on other people's resources. Um, one really interesting thing about community is that with the commenting feature, you can actually comment on a location in the file, um, which is just a, an interesting way to engage with others. Duplicating files and installing plugins like you probably know already because you've been duplicating files for homework the entirety of class doesn't require a public profile, but again, um, if you want to handle, do it now. <laughs> to create a profile, you just go to settings, um, click on the community tab, and then claim a handle. You can do that through, um, again, settings are right here, community. Um, I already have a profile, so it's going to show my profile there. Um, and then in order to interact, you just go ahead on community files. Um, and you can like, interact, um, follow, whatever you'd like to do on each particular file. I do not know why the comments will open. That should not be open. Awesome. Wow, now it's not working. Cool. Um, and when you want to publish on Community, once you have a profile, you're going to be able to do this within the file itself. So let's say that you're working on um, this file called Lecture 11 Special Topics Plus Accessibility. You go onto that file itself, and then under the Share button up at the top where you copy the link and you send it out for homework and everything, you might have seen, um, if you have a file already, um, that there's a tab that says Publish to Community. And when you click that, it's going to lead you through this whole process of different things that you can edit, like the description, all of the information that you see when we publish our um, lectures and content. Um, you can all have that edited um, and manipulated within the file itself. You can also continue to edit the file after it's published. We do this a lot, um, where we have to update small changes to the text, realign something, um, and you can push it as an update to community, which will just republish it. It doesn't make a new file. Um, it just um, updates it. So that's very convenient as well. So really quick, we can do a, oh my gosh, this broke. Um, quick demo of what this looks like in just a second. Again, it's this button that says share right here. It's going to open up a little modal pop-up um, with the option to publish to community. And then you just fill in all of the information and details that you'd like and go ahead and publish it for the world to see. And once you publish it, you can share the link. Send it to your friends, send it to your family, send it to your boss, send it to your teachers. Do whatever you want with it. It's a public link um, that you can do anything with. And then anybody can also duplicate it, look into your file, and also make remixes if they would like. So um, remixing, like we've mentioned, um, is when somebody duplicates a community file um, and makes any changes to it. Um, they do their own spin on something. Um, it creates a remix so that it's automatically attached to the source material, meaning that you're not like taking credit for um, another person's work as your own. It's connected to their source material. Um, and it allows you to kind of riff on other people's work. It's a big thing that um, you can take advantage of with things like templates. Um, one really interesting use case of remixes is that with some of Figma's existing playground files, different designers from around the world will make a remix in a translated language. So some of the like copy-paste playground, there's a Chinese translation for it that's attached as a remix, so you can easily find it uh, if you need it in a different language. Awesome. So really quick demo on how exactly to do this. So what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to unpublish and republish this file and just to get you um, to take a look at uh, how to actually do this. So if we go into uh, my files, I can go to labs, click on lab 11. Um, and then from here, I'm going to unpublish this. So just don't look. Pretend I didn't do that. I'm on my file. I've worked on it for several days or half an hour. Um, and I'm ready to publish it um, to the world. I can go ahead and click share. Um, on this tab again, this is invite and this is publish to community. If I go to publish to community, I see this little graphic and the option to publish. I type in anything I want here, um, test, 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 demo. Um, we can work on that later. I added any tags. So um, we always tag all of our content, Figma decal, um, education, a whole slew of other things, um, that sort of thing. Um, with FigJam, I can actually also upload an image for my custom thumbnail. So in this case, I want to grab this called thumbnail um, lab put it in there. And then as a creator, um, this is not something that you would necessarily see. Um, for Figma decal, you might know that we function as like a team on Figma. So we have a creator handle. So I'm going to publish it as Figma decal, but I can also tag myself as somebody who worked on this file as like a co-author. Um, yeah. So with that, I can go ahead and publish it. And immediately, you're going to be able to see it live on community. Yay. Um, another thing that you might notice is that this already says it has two duplications, even though I submitted it 
uh, two seconds ago. Um, if you do happen to publish an update or unpublish something and republish it, it does maintain all of those kind of stats on it, which is helpful um, if you ever have to like, if you make a file and it goes viral and then you have to edit it, it'll still be viral. It's totally okay. Um, those are going to persist for you. Any questions on how to publish to community? Cool. I hope you all do it. That would be awesome. Also, a lot of the people on staff have really cool community files. You should check them out. You can go find them. A lot of them have their names on community. Cool. I'm going to close this because the right and left arrows stopped working. Um, so we'll see if this works. Um, but the next thing we're going to talk about is some of the Fig Jam updates. Um, these are a lot of fun, and I could probably spend like half an hour just showing you all of the cool updates. Actually, if anybody on staff wants to hop in one of the files with me, um, it should be under um, logistics and branding and be called Fig Jam Playground. If you can, f does anyone want to do that? Who's who's doing it? Thanks, Annie. We're going to play Connect 4 together. Um, cool. So I'll go ahead and talk about these Fig Jam updates. So again, these came out around week six when we actually had the Fig Jam lecture, and then we couldn't make content for it. So now there's content for it. Um, if you remember plugins um, from a couple of weeks ago, these are actually now usable in Fig Jam as well. And there's a lot of really interesting ones that um, are both useful and also fun. So in Fig Jam, you can kind of extend the features of the tool by adding these plugins and adding all this extra capability um, with a lot of flexibility. And all of these different plugins are made on community. And they're a really great resource for things like, uh, hey, I want spell check. Hey, I want to find a way to get all of the components of one type. Hey, I just want to do something really fun, like a silly little magic marker that detects when I draw a rectangle and makes it look nice for me. This is a really cool plugin that uses some really cool AI stuff. I would check it out. Um, there's a whole treasure trove of different plugins you can use that are specific to Fig Jam, used in both Figma, Figma and Fig Jam. Um, just so explore them. If there's ever something that you're like, oh, I wish Figma had the functionality to do X, Y, Z. Somebody probably thought that and knew how to code and already made it for you. Um, so go ahead and check those out. Now, widgets are super unique. Um, it's something that is only usable in Fig Jam right now, but they're basically these little apps or like little applets that you can add to a file, like this photo booth, where you can drag in a camera, give access to um, camera on your computer, and then actually put out these photos that anybody can put into the file. So I've been in files where like everyone um, takes a photo of themselves, puts it in, edits the text, draws on each other's photos. Um, it's really cute. <laughs> it's a really nice way to add a little bit of something fun into your files. Um, but also, there's some more practical ones, like polls, charts, um, ways to do voting. Um, there's like a stocks widget. If you really like stocks and you're like doing your work, which you really want to check the stocks while you're working, um, you can do that really easily. Um, and I'll, play, I'll show you some of the fun widgets with Annie in a second. Code blocks. If you're working on a file with a developer, um, and you, for any reason, want to drop in snippets of code, this is a really easy way to just have nicely formatted stuff um, so you don't have to worry about all of the um, syntax issues um, that you would normally have if you were just typing it in text. So I recently had one case where we were doing a bug bash for somebody's feature, and we needed to run a little bit of code. Um, and so we were able to just grab these code blocks um, and paste it into um, the console in order to really quickly fix that up. Um, also, if you are somebody who codes, you can just, they look really nicely formatted. So it's just an easy way to have quick ways to screenshot snippets of code if you need them. And finally, this might not be super relevant to you, um, but if you're ever running a workshop, if you want anybody who doesn't normally use Figma to take a look at something you're working on, there's now something called Open Sessions, which allows you to have 24 hours on any Fig Jam file where anybody can edit it, even if they don't have an account. Um, so if you're doing something like, hey, I'm running a icebreaker event for my club and I wanted to use Fig Jam, you don't have to worry about everyone in the club downloading Figma or making a file or making an account. You can have an open session, run it for 24 hours. Um, they won't be able to edit it after 24 hours, but in that time, they can do whatever they need. Um, and it's just a super easy way to run things like that. Cool. Any questions about any of those updates before we kind of play with them? Yeah, so the question was, does it ever get laggy with open sessions or Fig Jam in general? Yeah, I'd say that after a while, if your internet connection is not great, probably having like 20, 30, 40 people in a file is going to make it laggy. Um, but I think they've been pretty consistently working on that. I've been in files pretty regularly with around 20 people with no issue. 
Um, we've also been in files like on the first day of class where there were about 50 people, and we were on crappy Air Bears Wi-Fi. Um, and it was pretty laggy, but still usable. But I was also streaming on my computer. Um, but yeah, the, whether or not it's on open sessions shouldn't actually affect the lagginess, um, just the number of people. Cool. Yeah, any other questions? OK. <coughs> There's some people on this file. Hello, Annie. Um, would you like to pick a widget for us to play with? Photo booth. Photo booth. OK, let's take some pictures. Um, so we can actually both use the same widget. Annie can use it on her own end, and then I will take one too. Um, Annie does not have a webcam, so she's lying to me. She picked the worst possible thing to do. But one nice thing about this is that you can actually go in and edit this text ever. I'm going to write, Annie is a liar. Um, and then anyone can go in and add stamps to it, interact with however you want. Um, but we can do something a little bit more active. Um, we can do connect four. OK, we're going to speed run this. We're not going to play the whole thing. <coughs> But yeah, this is all fully functional within Figma. Um, you don't have to add anything besides the widget itself. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, you can also learn to make your own widgets if you are interested in learning how to code. Um, they have a really great API, I think, for developing these widgets, and it is um, cool. OK, we're not going to play the whole game, but I don't want Andy to beat me in public. So I'm going to close this now. But this is the general gist of how widgets work. You, you notice with some of these, um, you can click and interact with them directly. But something else to note is for something like a poll, um, sometimes um, you have this thing where it pops up an extra tool, like with the photo booth. Um, so this happens because the widget looks the same to everybody on the file. So if Tiffany's on this file right now, she can see us playing Connect 4. She can't interact. Um, but with this poll, when I'm adding these like options and questions, nobody else can see this right now, um, which is helpful if you need to do like secret voting. Um, you don't want everybody to know what you're voting for. So in this case, if I vote for the second option, um, I didn't know Annie was voting for it because I saw her cursor moved off to the side. So yeah. Play with widgets. They're very fun. You can treat them like the timer, basically. Awesome. <coughs> OK, uh, we're going to get through this section, and then I think we'll take a quick break um, before we talk about accessibility. So looking beyond, what do you feel like you can do with Figma in the future? Um, whether you want to go into product design, whether you want to go into visual design, branding, anything like that, we're going to talk through a couple of different possible career paths that utilize Figma in some way. Um, it's not going to be exhaustive. I think there's a lot of ways that I've learned people use Figma in the last like three weeks that I had no idea, and we made these slides longer ago. Um, but also personally, I'm interested in hearing from y'all. Like when you took this class, what did you expect to want to do with Figma versus what do you think you'll do now? Audience participation time. If any students or any of the staff want to talk about what they do with Figma now or what they'd like to do, I'm looking for two participants. And then we'll move on. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, so the student said um, that they saw their friend prototyping with them and were really interested in learning how to do prototyping. But upon practicing it, really enjoyed using the pen tool more than they thought that they would. So. Pen tool. Anyone else? Angelina. Oh. Oh my god. OK, so that was um, somebody saying they were doing it for UX, someone saying that they're planning out their studio space in Figma, interior design, um, and also someone is making a manga and anime wall. Um, for their, for their room, I suppose, because it's easy to lay it out in Figma. Awesome. All very cool and very different um, kind of directions you can go in. I don't know if I can say that you're going to be able to make a career out of making Ming and anime walls, but I would like for you to prove me wrong. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about different careers that you can get into. Uh, first thing is go work at Figma. Uh, <coughs> yep. Please. And the next thing is um, more expected um, UI and UX design in general. So. A lot of the time, you're going to see um, 
different job opportunities that are probably under a couple of different names. So UI designer, UX designer, product designer, um, interaction designer, anything like that um, generally falls under the kind of umbrella of generally speaking, web and mobile design. Um, that's not necessarily a catch-all. Um, there's a lot of other things that you can do there as well. Um, and a lot of different kind of job titles that you might see if you're seeking out that kind of job. Um, we're just showing some kind of arbitrary files that you can look into. Um, but UI design is probably something that you were expecting me to say when I said careers that use Figma. Um, it is steadily becoming a more common tool. Um, it's fingers crossed overtaking sketch one day, maybe. Um, and I think it's doing pretty well in terms of um, something that employers are looking for. So please put this on your resume, if nothing else. <laughs> if you didn't get anything else out of this class, you can say you put Figma on your resume now. It's a skill that you have, and you're able to do um, all the mechanic mechanical tools of it. Um, here's another example of some really nice web design made in Figma for Hack the, no Hack the North. You can check out all of these links if you're on um, the prototype itself or on the file itself. Um, these are all links um, and just different examples of um, different things that you can make within Figma. Um, so something that we actually didn't explore that I guess I can talk about here um, is scrollable pages. Um, so you see that this is a website design, but obviously the pages themselves are not actually the dimension of your computer screen. Um, so they've made these pages scrollable, and you've been able to design like the way that the entire page is going to flow, as opposed to just the top, the top screen of it. Um, that's not really related to today's content, but I just realized we never really talked about scrolling. It's a little bit tricky to get used to, but it's basically a frame that extends, um, or content that extends beyond the bounds of the frame. Another example of um, nice UI wireframes here. So wireframing um, is also a skill that you've picked up um, in terms of making things that are lower fidelity and understanding kind of interaction beyond just um, all the bevels and the gradients and all the colors that you have to add, understanding um, exactly how to solve a problem with user research and user testing um, and how to slowly iterate towards a solution, which I've seen you all do in your midterms and your projects. So a little bit more interesting of an example that you can think about, especially if you really enjoyed prototyping or smart animate, is motion design. So I wouldn't say Figma is actually a tool commonly used as a vector for motion design because um, you can't actually export the GIFs, but it is commonly used as like designing assets that will later be used in like After Effects or another tool. Um, so there are a lot of folks who do things like virtual reality or motion design that will use Figma at some point in their process. Um, a lot of the time, those um, fields require that you have mastery over a lot of different software. Um, so one example with like virtual reality design is like you would do a mock-up in paper and then do your prototyping in Figma, make your assets in Figma or in Illustrator, bring that over to whatever the crap the virtual reality software is, because I don't know what they are, um, bringing it back to Figma for doing things like um, mocking up what it might look like in a web page. Um, so learning all of these different tools, if you're going into something like motion design or going into something like VR, um, is going to be important for you. Figma is now under your belt. It is something that you're going to be able to utilize. It doesn't mean that you have to be utilizing it in a particular way. It doesn't mean you have to be doing prototyping. It doesn't mean you have to be doing um, smart animate and pen tool and all of that stuff. You can kind of pick and choose what parts of this tool you personally want to be able to do. That said, these are all made in Smart Animate. It's just a really cool testament to how you can use these different um, tools in at your disposal here. I still, I've stared at this for a long time. I don't understand how it works. Um, but these other ones, I think I can kind of understand a little bit better. Um, if you're interested in doing things like this, I think Figma is a really accessible way to start understanding um, the physicality of motion design without having to dive into the difficult tool like After Effects. So if doing these little animations is something that you find interesting, um, learn about how they keyframed this. You know, how do they decide what is going to go where, when, uh, and dig into this file and learn about all of that. Um, branding is actually a really um, integral part also of Figma as a tool um, because of design systems. So we talked about this uh, concept of styles, color styles, and textiles. Um, this aspect of um, having a system for your design is a really critical component of any kind of branding. So we've looked into how. Um, to replicate another company's branding when we did some of the homework at the beginning of the class, and also our entire brand system is within Figma as well. Um, you can check out um, a lot of different examples of full brand systems on Community as well. So this is one from um, the podcast design table. You can see how they've created all their content and all their mock-ups mock within Figma. They even have this animated version of their logo that you can check out. 
Um, but Figma is a great tool for doing this because of the, the library functionality um, and the ability to, within larger organizations, share these files and share all these components um, that anybody can access even if you don't talk with them directly or work with them directly. This is another example of some illustration systems. So if you're more interested in the side of graphics, of visuals and illustration, um, which I personally am as well, um, if you really enjoyed any of the pen tool assignments that we did, you can definitely look into using Figma for illustration. Um, it, my sister professionally does illustration in Figma as well. Like it's definitely a thing that people are able to do. Um, so this is an example of Uber Eats illustration system that uses Figma as well. Um, I'm actually unclear about if this particular illustration was made within Figma or if this, they're, they're using it. Um, as a way to store um, because it is like an easily accessible and shared surface that uh, Adobe Illustrator isn't necessarily. Um, but either way, they're utilizing Figma in some way to have this system. And when we say illustration system, it means that it has all these modular pieces that you can take in and out. It has adjustable things. So a lot of the time, um, you can see something like this um, uh, illustration system by Bonnie K. Wolf. Um, this is called Paper Dolls. And it is a really <laughs> charming system. I think it's just really gorgeous. And this is made entirely in Figma. Um, and it's modular in the sense that all these different people are changeable. You can change their hair color, skin color, clothing color. You can change the way that they're standing um, with all these different kind of pieces. And they've called it paper dolls to emulate those physical, actual paper dolls that you would play with as a kid, that you cut out, you cut out all the different clothing, um, and play with them in that way. And then things like these buildings are also interchangeable. So by having an illustration system, you're able to create a lot of distinct and different illustrations without having to uniquely illustrate each one necessarily. So if you're making a landing page for like Uber Eats, where you have to have a lot of food, just a lot of these banner images for all different kinds of cuisines, having a modular system where you can inter interchange like, oh, here, I'll have different skin tone hands, I'll have different utensils, I'll have different color, you'll have different foods, um, is an easy way to create a lot of illustrations in a quick and efficient way. And you know, we could probably dive into the whole discussion of like corporate tech art and why it's bad, but um, that's a discussion for a longer time and I would encourage you to think critically about it and think about you know, why are these systems most effective in certain cases. Um, if you're interested in lettering or anything that is more visual like this, I know a lot of people use these, uh, use like Procreate or use iPads for these. Um, but you are also able to do these in vectors as well. So if this is something that you're interested in, these letter forms are obviously made in a different way where they've had to understand um, the edges and curves of the outside of the lines as opposed to just the individual strokes. Um, and I would say that doing any kind of lettering um, is very different from doing actual physical calligraphy because of the way that you have to understand the vectors. But it is obviously an option that you can do. Creating all these beautiful vector illustrations within Figma is something that you can do um, whether you want to start a small business and have your own art, um, or if you want to do it for um, different companies, if you want to work on branding, if you want to work on um, any kind of personal work. Lettering is a really interesting way to start with that. OK, this is not like actually like a, like they're, they're not actually a game designer, but this is a game that somebody made in Figma. Um, and I think it also can communicate um, if you are interested in using Figma for personal projects in the future. Um, there's a lot of potential. Like as they kind of roll out these new features and all of these different capabilities, this was made six months ago, I think before interactive components were out of beta. And so this is an incredibly, even though it kind of just looks like a little alien going up and down and shooting some stuff, um, it's an incredibly complicated thing to be able to do. Um, and I would definitely not hesitate to try things if you're learning how to do different things in Figma, especially with the capability of things like plugins and widgets and being able to embed code into your designs. There's a lot of flexibility in what you can do. Um, I linked a couple of different projects for different people that um, submitted relevant proposals, um, but there's a really interesting game called Dr. Belmont and the Disease that is um, made in Figma as well, that is just this gorgeous prototype um, where they think the illustrations were probably made in something else, but it, it's just like this whole process made entirely in Figma. The sky is the limit. You know, there is a lot that you can make. Um, and I think interactive games are going to be a really interesting way to, you know, learn how to do game design, learn how to do interaction design, learn how to make all of these different assets without ever actually having to touch code. Um, so this is a really great opportunity if you are interested in games um, but don't really have um, the, the time or the skill set to learn game development at this time. Yeah, any other questions about anything that I talked about? Or if there is something I didn't address, I will spin it in a way that uses Figma. Yeah. How do you do pixel art in Figma? How do you do pixel art in Figma? So 
pixel art by its nature is pixel based, it's raster based. Um, and if we talked about this before with vector art, vectors don't rely on pixels necessarily, they rely on mathematical curves. So the sense of getting like a singular pixel in Figma with like a brush is not something you're gonna be able to do, but you can use squares. Like you, you can just make a whole bunch of squares and treat them all as an individual pixel. It's gonna be a little bit of a hacky way to do it. Um, so if you were interested in doing pixel art and exploring it deeply, I would highly recommend a program called Graphic Scale. Um, and I would lean away from doing it in non-pixel art intended tools because the tool set is actually very different. I did like a small deep dive on pixel art several years ago. Um, the tool set that you would need is very distinctly different um, from a vector tool like Adobe Illustrator or um, Figma. But if it's something that you wanna do for like your final or just for fun, I would just use a lot of squares and make sure that you have snap to pixel grid on um, and navigate that way. Um, also, Jason made a um, presentation for Hex for innovative design on how to do pixel art in Illustrator. I took a look at it. I don't think it's necessarily exactly applicable to Figma because he used a lot of the um, tools that are in Illustrator that aren't in Figma, um, but I'm happy to share that later if you'd like it as well. Cool. Any other questions? Awesome. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and take a little bit of a break, maybe like three or so minutes um, before we dive into accessibility. Um, so feel free to get up, take a drink of water, anything you need. We're gonna start again at 7.49. <coughs>
Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started again um, with this half on revisiting accessibility. Cool, so um, we talked about this a little bit during week five, talking about just kind of surface level um, understanding of what accessibility is. So today we're gonna dive a little bit more deeply into universal design and also look, about, look at how um, you can actually work to make your designs accessible in a way beyond just kind of the WCAG guidelines. So when you think about accessibility, a lot of the time people understand it as an end product or something that you happen to tack onto your um, process at the very end. Um, but the reality is that you should be thinking about accessibility and inclusion throughout the entirety of your process. Whenever you're working on a different project for the first time, thinking about um, all of these needs and all of these considerations from the moment that you start doing user research all the way up until you deliver the final product. Um, so yeah, so accessible design and inclusive design as practices tend to focus on the intent and the design process as opposed to the final product itself. It's learning, it's practicing what you preach essentially and making sure that this is something that you think about throughout the entire um, design journey. So we've talked also about um, WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, um, developed by the Web Accessibility Initiative in order to make um, specifically digital design and web design more accessible. And these are pretty standard. You know, most things have to abide by these rules um, in terms of things like visual accessibility, images, hierarchy, presentation, sounds, and so forth. Um, so one quick example that we talked about is this ratio um, of 4.5 to 1 for text. So previously, you know, um, the white is not always accessible in every color that we have. Um, the blue is also genuinely like not readable on these projector screens. It's a little bit more readable on my computer screen. Um, and something also to think about is that this contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1 is a bare minimum. And all the time, I think you aim for something higher, closer to the ballpark of 7 to 9 um, for higher contrast text. Um, so the white on blue um, text from before um, passes in large text but fails in smaller text. Um, so this is a use case where you would want to make sure that maybe the blue is the color that we'd have to change. Another piece is to not rely solely on color to convey information. Um, so instead of having everything organized by color, including things like labels, including things like maybe textures even. Um, so say you're looking at something like a BART map or a train map. A lot of the time it's relying strictly or purely on color, um, which can be difficult to navigate if you have any kind of color blindness, and also is generally difficult to read. So adding things like clear labeling throughout the entirety of a line, adding things like texture or patterning into the lines um, might make it, make it a little bit more readable and accessible to anybody. Um, and beyond just being visually accessible, it'll just be easier for anybody to read and understand, especially if it's a case of a map or something that people have to scan extremely quickly, something that people have to understand at just a glance. It's really important to make sure that um, you're not relying on just one thing to convey information. Um, you might have seen a lot of forms that do this, which um, it's kind of like filler text, placeholder text, um, and a lot of the time, this is not a great pattern um, because the issue is that as soon as you click on it, um, the information for the label is gone. As soon as you start typing, you um, won't be able to see it anymore. You won't be able to cross-reference it once you finish the entire form. You'll think about, um, you know, maybe intuitively some things might come back to you, like, oh, this was probably from my address line one and address line two, but that's not always the case, and not everybody's able to recall that information. So. Having the text be um, permanent above, having it be sticky, so that once you start typing, it still persists. Once you um, change it, it still persists, is a really important thing to think about as you make these basic things like a login screen or a sign up screen on an app. This comes up a lot. It's very frequent, and it's something that's made much better very easily. Um, and on top of that, one more thing to note is that often, because this placeholder text is not really important, um, it is too light of a gray or too light of a color to be readable. Um, and it's not generally, um, you know, it's impossible to tell if you have low vision um, what you exactly have to put into this label. Providing non-visual forms of information is also really important. It's not something that's necessarily um, always going to be in scope if you're working on just the design aspect of your work. Um, so if you're working on something that is also going to be implemented in code or implemented in some other format, it might be easier to include this. But with um, designing something, like for your um, final projects, for example, you might not have to um, build out all of this. Um, but you can think about like, hey, um, 
I'm going to make sure that everything is optimized for speech to text, or I'm going to make sure that there's an option on, let's say, this restaurant menu um, to have um, photos of the food uh, for people who cannot understand English as their first language, um, or an option to have the menu read aloud, or options to make it more accessible um, in some way or another. So providing speech to text features on the interface is important um, for users who are deaf or hard of hearing, or generally in any sense um, unable to, um, or sorry, speech to text, um, yeah, 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 is an important feature. Um, so like one example of something that we could actually be doing better as a course is that last semester we were able to provide um, auto-generated subtitles because we had class on Zoom, but because we have class on Twitch, we are not, uh, we are, don't have the capacity to do live captioning. And so that's something that we want to be able to work on in the future is providing um, speech to text in some way um, via subtitles for um, different students. So one way that you might see this manifest that you might have not necessarily have noticed before is a lot of newspapers um, have an audio version of their articles provided. So whether that looks like this or like as a SoundCloud link, um, there's a recording here of a New York Times article that's read aloud and then a recording of several articles from the Atlantic. So this is providing a second way to um, basically access this information, um, which is helpful for um, people with low vision, people who are blind, but also helpful for people who are busy, people who are on the go and they want to be able to listen to these articles, um, people who um, have to, what is it? I don't remember what I was gonna say. Uh, if, there's, if there's something that's like temporarily distracting them, like if their computer screen is broken, like if your phone screen is broken, but you need to listen to the content's article, this is another way that you can do it. Um, so again, thinking about um, disability as you go through all of these different design decisions, but also considering generally how designing accessible content makes things better for everyone. All text and image descriptions um, are also something that people talk about a lot with um, WCAG guidelines. So. Alt text, just to give you this um, spiel again one more time, um, is generally shorter. It's the most vital information in an image. Um, it's called alt text, and one way that you can often access it, I think it's less common now, but it used to be common in the past, um, is if you hover over an image on a site, sometimes the um, like a, a piece of text will appear as you hover. That's the alt text. So this is really common, I think, in older internet, but for some reason is not as common now. Um, but because it is just a short tag that's meant to show up where your mouse cursor is, um, we like to keep it under one or two sentences or less than 140 characters. Um, except for possibly the case where it's a like text-based image, like an infographic, you would want to have all the text conveyed. An image description, on the other hand, is generally um, longer. It is a more detailed account of the image. Um, it still provides key information um, as quickly as possible, um, but it's meant for a human to be reading it as opposed to necessarily being um, like a computer-generated piece of text. Um, but yeah, another example of where alt text appears is if an image does not load, um, it'll bring up the alt text tag um, instead of the image itself. So an example here um, of the same image as alt text versus image description. The alt text here would be a gray tabby cat with green eyes lying on a window perch. So with this, you have the object, the subject of um, the image with brief descriptors on what it is and then what it is doing. So this format of saying like what is doing what or who is doing what, where, when, um, is an important thing to think about um, as you write alt text. And in this image description, you still have a similar um, start out with a gray tabby cat with green eyes lying on a pink and gray scarf on a window perch. That in itself gives me the whole image. I know what is happening. Um, it gives me further information to describe the scene. So the sky outside of the window is bright and blue. The cat is looking over the side of the perch with his paws crossed. So it's giving me further information that enhances my understanding of the image and of the photo. Um, but the first sentence does still give me the entire picture. So if I started with like the background is a dark room and there is a bright blue sky. Um, in the front, you can see that the cat is on a scratching pose. Like that's not actually telling me what's in the image initially. So you want to make sure that as quickly as possible, the reader understands what they're seeing. So clear hierarchy and organization. Generally good practice, it's also more accessible. So information should be clear and easy to understand as poor organization of information makes it difficult to follow. It's harder to understand um, what the reader's intent is and what you're supposed to be um, focusing on as you go through a design. So maintaining clear and simple organization um, guides somebody through a design. So doing things like left aligning your text if possible if you're writing in English or another left aligned language or left to right language. 
and using weight to classify hierarchy. And again, this is going to fluctuate as you look into uh, different languages and localization, things like that. Um, if you were to, for example, um, have, some, have a design that's in Arabic, you wouldn't want to follow the exact same um, rules that you would follow as you would for English. So you can think about something like, how does a newspaper look different in different countries around the world? How is that formatted in a way that's as readable as possible, as quickly as possible, um, to people who are native in that particular language? Cool. Any questions about any of that? Awesome. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, now that we've learned a little bit more about the WCAG guidelines and accessibility, how um, there are a couple of case studies that we can go into uh, seeing accessible design in action. So accessibility can be effectively incorporated into literally anything, anything in your life um, that you're designing, that you're creating, that you're interacting with. Um, it's going to have some kind of barrier for entry. And the goal is to keep that barrier of entry, um, for the most part, as minimal as possible. And a really interesting way that we can talk about that is through games. Um, games have a whole treasure trove of opportunity to make things more accessible, and a lot of games don't. Um, the reality is that um, a lot of major game companies are optimizing for as many players as possible, as quickly as possible, um, which means that they're focusing mostly on able-bodied um, gamers, um, so they aren't really focusing on um, different markets and making the games as accessible as possible. But over the past couple of years, you've seen this um, is shifting slowly. More mainstream games are providing more options to be accessible. Um, starting with remapping is something that a lot of consoles and a lot of games allow you to do now. This refers to um, changing the in-game function of different keys or buttons on the controller. Um, so when you think about how this would improve somebody's quality of life, if you only have one hand, Obviously, you're not going to be able to necessarily use the controller as it is intended. If you do not um, have like fine motor skills, you might not be able to function with a um, analog joystick and might want to have a digital joystick instead um, of pressing buttons on a D-pad. Um, another example is if you have RSI or arthritis, where you aren't comfortable holding um, a kind of uncomfortably created controller, and you need to have your hands in a more ergonomic position, remapping might be something that allows you to still enjoy the game without having to purchase a separate piece of equipment. So remapping also is going to lower that barrier of entry of purchasing another item um, by allowing you to optimize what you currently have already. Here's an example of a game that does it. Minecraft. Minecraft has a lot of versatility in control mapping. Um, it's helpful also um, that it's a keyboard um, as opposed to necessarily a physical game controller for the most part, which gives you a lot more flexibility. There are so many buttons on a keyboard. There's so many different types of keyboards as well. Um, and you can re reassign most controls in game. Um, there's this distinct um, level also of games where um, the game exists, but it also exists within a console. And there are currently some games where you can remap within the game, um, but you can't remap at a console level. And there's also consoles that allow you to remap at a console level for games that don't necessarily allow you to do it. And this distinction is important because different games have different functions. You know, as a developer, you would choose like the A button is going to do this. Um, so maybe the A button in Mario Kart accelerates you, but the A button in another game um, slashes your sword. And you wouldn't necessarily want those to always be the same button, as um, logically, those might not necessarily be the same functions to you. Oh, so thinking about remapping um, and thinking about how this might manifest in non-game situations, where you give somebody full autonomy on how they want to interact with what you create. Um, is really interesting. Um, I think games give you a really distinct idea of like push button to walk, press this button to do this. Um, that is a little bit less distinct in a lot of digital design, like saying um, tapping something on your phone or long pressing something on your phone or clicking a mouse. Um, these are all different vectors um, for um, providing more accessibility. And so one quick way that you can think about this is keyboard navigation for any kind of website. So a lot of websites are keyboard navigable, where you don't have to use your mouse. Um, but a lot of websites also are not keyboard navigable, where if you try to navigate to a different part of a form, for example, you have to just keep tabbing over and over and over. And it's not easy um, to get to the content that you need to get. So this is another example of another game. Um, we just talked a lot about games on this course staff. Um, but the puzzle in this game called Undertale relies on players who are listening to a song and playing it on a piano in another room. So you walk into one room. If you sit there for long enough, there's an audio clip that plays. Um, and then when you walk into the other room, you have to play it on a piano. After the game released, um, the creator realizes it's not accessible and patched the puzzle um, to have a visual solution instead. So you can see <coughs> just barely up here that um, these different arrows 
sorry. <coughs> arrows and circles appear um, and allow you to see the result of the puzzle without having to hear it. So if you are a deaf or hard of hearing player, you'd be able to actually get the secret or get to this bonus puzzle. Um, even if you can't necessarily hear the audio. This is also helpful if, say, your headphones are broken, your speaker is broken, your computer is jank as hell and doesn't play audio anymore for some reason. Um, so it's a helpful in a variety of ways as well. Um, another example of a game that has done a really good job with um, accessible design is Celeste. So Celeste is a platforming game that's known for having generally very difficult gameplay. It is a hard game, and that's part of kind of the process is understanding how to improve while you're playing it. But given that the game um, has a really important storyline um, and that the kind of the core of the game is also talking about personal growth, um, the creators wanted to be intentional with adding a helpful mode. So what they've done is create something called assist mode that lets you modify the game to reduce the difficulty in a lot of different ways. So instead of saying just like, hey, there's normal mode and then we're gonna give you like an easy mode, um, we're going to give you a like, mode for little babies. Like, they're not being self-deprecating in any way. They're not being patronizing to the user. Um, they're saying that, like, we designed this to be challenging but accessible. And we believe that difficulty is essential to the experience. Um, and we understand that your players play differently. If it's inaccessible to you because of the difficulty, we hope that this customizable mode lets you enjoy it. So with this mode, they've done things like slowing the game down, um, granting yourself invincibility or infinite lives, skipping chapters, doing a lot of different things like adding um, extra functionality to the gameplay. And one of the most interesting things about this is that this clearly wasn't tacked on at the end of the experience. This is something that the developers thought through very carefully and you can tell in the care that they put into this process and also in the variety of features that they offered. So when you're creating something and you want to make sure that it is accessible, instead of thinking about like, oh, accessibility mode, like everything is bigger text and everything is higher contrast, think about this aspect of customization and allowing the user to decide what it is that they need, what it is, is that is important to them as they navigate your work. Um, that makes it more accessible and that makes it more useful. Yeah, so this is an example of like how the assistant actually works. Um, so you can see here that these spikes that normally would have harmed the player do not harm them. Um, and then this bottom of the map that normally you would fall through, this bottom, they actually are able to just jump on it and interact with it so that they don't have to worry about falling. Um, but the gameplay still functions and you're still able to complete the level in a way that still feels satisfying to you. Captioning is another example of um, something that has become a lot more widespread slowly and surely. Um, but again, this piece of customization is really important as well. So a lot more games and movies and general kinds of media have captions as a more common staple. Um, and these are, again, helpful to people who are deaf and hard of hearing, but also to literally anybody. Um, YouTube captions are very customizable, allowing you to change things like the font itself, um, the, con the color, the size, the contrast, anything that is important to you, um, where one person's captions ideally might look very different from another person's. Um, on your phone, um, some people here might already use these kind of um, accessibility features as well. Um, so uh, you have an op option in an iPhone to bold text to make um, labels show an off and an on state. So in this example, you see that um, the off state has this, like a zero, and then the on state has a one um, with this larger accessibility sizes. Apps that have dynamic type will allow you to um, scale it up to the exact size you want, so just small, medium, large. So again, these pieces of um, customization and assistance are going to make the phone itself more usable to a lot more people. Um, and you know, if you think about this from a business perspective, you're going to be able to get more users onto your product. Because if an Android phone is not providing all these accessibility options, people are going to be more likely to purchase the iPhone over the Android if it is a, something that they need in order to be able to use. Cool. Any questions about any of that? I'm going to take a sip of water, and then we're going to talk about universal design and the seven principles of universal design. Good. I'm going to go through these a little bit quickly, because I think my voice is starting to go, um, but you'll be able to reference these in the future as well. Um, so universal design exists as a kind of culmination of the principles that we've been discussing with usable, accessible, and inclusive design. 
Um, we didn't really distinctly differentiate the difference between all three of these. If you Google them, you're going to learn that they're all different, slightly different frameworks. We've talked about them all a little bit more vaguely as just a general framework of good design practice, uh, but universal design aims to hit all three of these. It is design that encompasses the needs of users to the greatest ability without the need for any kind of extra accommodations. Um, so universal design, unlike accessible and inclusive design, focuses on the end products and focuses on what exactly you are creating as opposed to thinking about what you're doing in the process. You know, are you making sure to have all these different um, requirements as you go through? I mean, just think about um, the qualities of the end design, you know, what the final thing you make is. So we mentioned earlier about accessibility through different things like an assist mode, through an easier um, version of what you're doing. Uh, universal design would reject that more likely um, and say that the um, product as it exists standard should be usable by everyone. So the seven principles here um, emphasize end result over process and intent and are usually applied to the built environment. So a lot of this focuses on things like um, physically going places, so if they think about like ADA guidelines, for example. Um, but we'll go through all these principles now. So the first is equitable use. The first principle um, ensures that design is useful for a wide variety of people, which should allow everyone to access it in the same way or through an equivalent way. So equitable use talks about um, not that somebody who is um, unable to open up a door has to do a different format in order to get through the door. It should be that everybody is doing it in the same way. Everybody is able to experience the same way. So automatic sliding doors are convenient for use um, of any people of any ability um, because it opens for you. You do not have to interact with it in any way. The second is flexibility in use. Um, so the second principle um, focuses on how design should accommodate a wide range of abilities. Um, so scissors are one common complaint of left-handed people, um, where scissors are almost always built for people who are right-handed. Um, but having the option to then choose a left-handed scissors or having them available in a classroom or having them available in an office um, introduces more flexibility. So this is an example, obviously, where it's not a single product. They're not making like uh, ambidextrous, I think is the word, ambidextrous scissors. Um, universal design might actually prefer that that was the case, where you create one tool that anybody can use. Um, but this is another opportunity to think about how sometimes there are cases where it is better optimized for both parties to have two different options. Um, but in this case, you can also think about how a classroom might buy 20 pairs of right-handed scissors and one pair of left-handed scissors, um, which is not necessarily fair to people who are unable to use them. The third principle is simple and intuitive use. Um, so this aspect of kind of connecting brain to function, thinking about the psychology of what a user is going through as they um, decide to interact with something, um, making sure that those decisions that the user has to make are simple and intuitive is really key. So um, all of these different things that you see here um, have different levels of kind of intuition. Um, with an elevator, this is a still image. You can't really tell which one is which. Um, you would only be able to tell as it's moving, but because it's moving, you'll be able to know. Um, but some elevators will afford additional things, like having a green means go sign here and a red means stop sign on the appropriate es elevator to escalator um, to make sure that people are using the correct ones. A stop sign is one of the most intuitive um, things that you might see. This is partially due to our mental schema of understanding, you know, red means stop. The word stop itself, um, the shape itself has become come to be associated with stop as well. Um, but it would be unintuitive if one day somebody in your town uh, stole all of them and made them into blue circles and said, this means stop now. That would not be intuitive. Um, push to open um, kind of door buttons are also intuitive and simple to use in that you don't have to do anything complicated, just push it gently. Um, they're always placed in a way that um, they're clearly attached to the door as well. Um, something that is not necessarily super intuitive are elevator buttons, where the ordering um, can change sometimes from elevator to elevator, where it can be from left to right, from bottom to top, it can be from top to bottom. These changes a lot, and pretty much every time you go into an elevator, you have to think about like, oh, which button am I trying to press? Every single time I see the door open and door close buttons, I have to like, like think about it and like use my hands and figure out which way I'm supposed to be pressing it because I do the wrong one a lot of the time. Um, if it had one that just said door open and one that said door closed, it would be less likely for me to um, intuit the wrong idea. And then another example, this IKEA catalog, um, these icons, for the most part, I can guess what they might mean. Um, so this is 
Um, keep upright. I have no idea what this means. This means it's fragile. Don't have a hook for a hand. Don't need the box. I don't know what these mean. I think this might be a joke, but I can't really tell, which means that these icons are not intuitive and they're not simple to understand. Another example, those laundry tags. Nobody knows what they mean. No one knows how to do their laundry. If you, if you do, then you have a superpower. Um, but that is not helpful um, for the most part. Another example is recycling. Numbers are not something that's easily intuit intuitive. Um, and so creating things like labels, being explicit, are gonna make things more intuitive. Perceptible information. So this fourth principle tackles the display of information, you know, how you're communicating something. Information displayed should be essential, simple, and displayed in multiple forms, whether that's tactile, visual, verbal, pictorial, et cetera, et cetera. So this bottom right is a better IKEA catalog um, that shows you how to build something or how to do something with no words. So this is something that they can use in any country, um, no matter what it is. Um, and they're able to communicate like, hey, you need um, a hammer, a screwdriver, and a pencil in order to make this um, particular piece of furniture. If you break something, or don't, in order to not break something, put it on a soft rug or a soft um, carpet so that you aren't going to damage the corners. And if you're confused, just call the IKEA. So I was able to figure all that out at first glance with no language because it using, it's using pictorial information. But if I weren't able to visually see this, if I were blind or had low vision, then I might be benefiting from something like um, these different accommodations at the De Young Museum. So the De Young Museum has different icons for different opportunities um, to experience pieces of art and pieces of um, the exhibits. So one might have an icon for Braille where I could feel um, the letters, and understand what I was um, reading. One would have an auditory um, headphones is the word, um, where you can have headphones and have like a spoken guide as you walk through the museum. Um, the Louvre also actually has this interesting tactile exhibit where they let you feel a replica of like the artifact that you're looking at to better understand how it um, looks if you aren't able to see it, um, accompanied by um, <coughs> textured maps of like say the region of origin um, and also braille. Um, this is an example of I think a subway line in Japan called the Nanakuma line that uses a variety of different um, pictures to express where you're going. Um, so I would presume that these different pictures are representative of each location, of each stop, whether that's in the name, um, or if they use these um, symbols repeatedly throughout um, the branding of the stop. So um, I can intuit that this top stop is going to bring me to a forested mountain of some kind. I, even if I can't read um, necessarily the um, text here, if I'm a tourist and I know that I'm going to a place that is famous for having a lot of lightning bugs, I know that I have to get off at this blue stop. Now, tolerance for error um, addresses also that piece of safety and easy usability. Um, so a design should be made in a way that minimizes room for error. Um, basically, you're going to expect your user to fuck up sometimes, and you want to make sure that you've accommodated for that if they do. Um, so information elements of a design should be displayed in a way that makes sense and provides warnings and hazards if needed. Um, so in this case of a kind of curved <coughs> sidewalk, it's critical that they have these um, curbs up here so that if you're, say, um, skateboarding or something, you don't just reel off into the side. You do have to hit the curb, which is going to hurt, but it minimizes your fall um, and it minimizes the distance that you end up traveling if you accidentally kind of skate over um, the edge of the sidewalk. In this um, example of, like this is what we talked about with the escalator, where having a, a green means go and a red means stop sign will tell you which side to get on if you're not easily understanding which side is moving the way it goes. Um, which is a lot easier to get confused in the example of like these, uh, I have no idea what they're called, uh, kind of human conveyor belts that they have in um, airports. Um, this is also additionally helpful if you're a tourist because in some countries you walk on the other side of the um, street and you stand on one side if you're an escalator. I think this happened when I visited a country and I, was, I, I kept walking into people because I was on the wrong side of the street. Um, so having any kind of um, signal on which side is correct is more accessible to say people who are visiting. Number six, low physical effort. Um, this ensures that designs can be used um, comfortably uh, with low physical effort, so without having to interact with it, without having to use force. Um, I think it's something like five pounds of force is like the maximum for any kind of door um, to follow ADA guidelines. So if you had a very heavy door, 
people physically can't get into it. Like a child cannot go into the door. Um, an elderly person cannot get into the door. A lot of people would not be able to physically go to the place if you have to have a high physical effort. You know, when you walk into, honestly, coming to Jacobs is an accessibility barrier because it is so high um, on campus, um, which is also partially a reason why we want to offer the class online. Um, that is the lowest possible physical effort, is, is to um, provide the class um, online and streamed, which is also why I hope that classes continue to offer this option. Um, but yeah, so this is a hand sanitizer or soap dispenser that requires no touch, um, and it's helpful for both physical effort and also um, hygiene and cleanliness, where you don't have to touch anything in order to interact with the object. And this bottom, I believe, is a door um, with a modified handle to make it easier um, to push forward instead of having to turn the door handle um, 90 degrees. And finally, um, the seventh principle of universal design is size and space for approach and use. So this states that um, they need to provide the appropriate size and space for a user regardless of ability, body size, or mobility. Um, signage and elements of the design should be accessible to a variety of users and should allow extra room for assistive devices, um, a wheelchair, for example, or crutches, um, and allow for personal assistance if, say, somebody has somebody that needs to um, guide them along or say that somebody has a service animal. Um, that there's always enough space um, for things like that. So when you see things like crowd capacity for a room, um, and it says it's a lot lower than you think it might be, um, if you were to stand shoulder to shoulder, it's likely an accessibility thing. It's also probably a fire marshal guideline. Um, but making sure that every person, you're not just using yourself as an understanding of how um, much space that a person takes up, and making sure that you're thinking about wheelchairs, you're thinking about service animals. Um, now that you're thinking about social distancing, all of that is a really key factor. Um, so this example here on the bottom is for some kind of elevator um, that has these very large buttons that you can likely kick or hit with your foot in order to access them um, without having to use, like we talked about, the unintuitive elevator key buttons that we've used in the past. Um, and this is, I believe, a BART station that has a priority lane that is a lot wider, allowing for somebody in a wheelchair um, or somebody who needs a little bit more space um, to walk through. Cool. And another couple really short case studies. We talked about the curb cut as one of like the most key um, battles, I think, in accessibility history. Um, it's not necessarily like, I, I think that Berkeley takes a lot more credit for this than it should, um, in that this was a very long and difficult battle, fought for a very long time. Um, but curb cuts are a way for people to easily um, get up and down the sidewalk without having to worry about um, the barrier of the curb itself. So if you're in a wheelchair or any kind of assisted device, you're more easily able to get onto the sidewalk. Um, tactile museum pathways, like we talked about at the Louvre. Um, so <coughs> in this example, um, you can see like this variety of different things that they've included um, so that people with low sight and low vision are able to still experience the um, exhibit. So they have a replica of um, this bowl or this vase that they have in the exhibit so that you're able to touch th um, the item itself. Next to it, because they had to make the replica in plastic, they have an example of the material, so you can feel what the material would be since they can't have the actual um, artifact out, um, or else it would be damaged. Um, Braille for the text of the um, kind of uh, description. And then also this raised illustration, so this tactile illustration where you can feel um, the designs that are on the particular piece. Um, this kind of maps on the head here um, to designs around the, the bowl itself. Um, and this isn't necessarily something that they're able to make for every single exhibit. It would be great if they did, but I don't think that they do. Um, but they do have this kind of pathway that leads you through um, as much of the exhibits as possible with as many um, accommodations as possible so that anybody um, can enjoy the work at the Louvre. And finally, um, this is a really interesting case study because I kind of looked at this picture the first time and I was like, oh, okay, it's a building. Um, but this is the Toto Universal Design Lab. So they're located in Kanagawa, Japan. And I think they're also behind that subway line we talked about earlier. Uh, and they're a design studio and lab that focuses specifically on universal design as well. Um, and so something interesting is that they've used a, a number of different markers to indicate all these different rooms. I think these are restrooms. And you can notice that there is a um, male restroom, field restroom, an all gender restroom, and a family restroom, which is an interesting array of options um, that allows that anybody feels as comfortable as they can in these different situations. Um, on top of that, they're all color coded, um, but beyond just the top color coding, they've also have floor color coding. So if you're walking around and um, you're looking towards the floor, um, you're able to really quickly see which room it is. And beyond just being at the door, it sticks out into the hallway, so you're able to see it a little bit more easily. And then on top of that, one more thing is I think that these um, handlebars that they have throughout the entire um, building in order to help you um, with mobility, um, also I think have textured um, handles 
when you're outside each of the bathrooms so you can physically touch and know which bathroom you're standing in front of. Awesome. Any questions about any of these case studies or universal design in general before we wrap up? <coughs> awesome. OK. Um, so the secret word for today is going to be firefly, F-I-R-E-F-L-Y, firefly. That's the secret word for the day um, in honor of that subway map. Um, and then really quickly, we'll go through a couple of announcements. Um, again, your final projects, that's all you need to work on for the remainder of the semester. Um, we'll send another message next week just to kind of keep everyone on track, but there again is no lecture or lab. They will still have office hours. Um, they might be a little bit more limited capacity, um, but please, we know that this is the last kind of opportunity to talk to us. Please come to office hours. Um, we'll have them on Friday and then Monday, Tuesday likely as well. If you have any questions, we're more than happy to help with demos. Um, I'm always really excited to see when people have questions because a lot of the time it's like, stuff that I cannot think of, and I really like seeing all of the work that you've been doing. Um, but yeah, if you ever wanted to just chat with anyone on course staff, you're more than welcome to come to office hours. Um, something that we're not officially announcing today, but I want you to start thinking about is if you're interested in becoming a TA next semester, we will be releasing like an application um, shortly after the semester ends. And if you are interested in hearing more about it, office hours are a great way to talk to literally the entire course staff. Um, so if you have any questions about what that looks like, feel free to come. Um, and then week 12 lecture, is not next week. Um, there is no class next week. Do not come here. Do not get on Twitch. Um, two weeks from today is our final class. Please make sure you can attend um, synchronously. Um, we're going to have a Q&A with Noah um, from Figma and then have final presentations from all of you. Um, we really encourage you to opt into presenting. You've been working really hard and we really want to see all the work that you've been doing. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out for more announcements. We will also still have lab on week 12. Um, as a way to get um, kind of final thoughts with your teams and also to provide feedback on this class because we really need feedback to make this class even better for the future. But yeah, thank you so much for coming tonight and I will see you in two weeks. Good luck with your finals. Bye-bye.